too, right? How long do we go for? Uh, we will go for about an hour. Welcome, folks, as you're coming in. We're going to, um, I'm Jody Rudora, and I'm the editor in chief of The Forward. We're going to give people a little bit of time <laughs> to join us from wherever they are rolling in. And we're going to also uh, soon broadcast this uh, conversation live on our Facebook page. And so once we do that, if you're game to help us share the link um, and maybe spread the word among your friends, that would be great. Um, Again, I'm Jody Rudor. Judy, I, I have, I, I have another conversation at seven, so right. my we'll time. So we have to finish. Uh, we will be okay. done. Again, I'm Jody Rudor, and I'm the editor in chief of The Forward. And thank you all for joining us today we, to talk about this incredibly important question about um, annexation of the West Bank and Israeli Palestinian relations uh, right now uh, and relations with the US and the world as well. We are thrilled to have for this conversation two of the most amazing experts on the Middle East conflict with decades of experience thinking about um, a two-state solution and what the possible paths to peace are between the Israelis and the Palestinians and the role of the US. We have David Makovsky um, from the Washington Institute of Near East Policy, the head of the Israeli Arab program there, um, he may or may not hop on the treadmill behind him in the middle of this conversation. Um, and then we have Khalil Shakaki, um, who's calling in from outside of Ramallah. If his audio is a little bit shaky, that's why. Um, I think we all, I think he had, seems to have the nicest setup of any of us, which is interesting. Khalil is the director of the Palestinian Center for Sur Policy and Survey Research. Um, one of the, uh, he is really the leading uh, analyst in the West Bank of the Palestinian situation of the Palestinian populace um, and does uh, regular polls of the Palestinian public that when I was the bureau, bureau chief uh, in Jerusalem for the New York Times, uh, I relied heavily on Khalil's insights and data as well as David's thoughtful analysis. So I'm really excited to have them for this conversation. And I want to start I wanna, with just a couple of programming notes. Um, we, will, uh, we will go uh, till about noon Eastern time or seven Ramallah time. Um, if you have a question that you want me to ask David or Khalil, um, please put it, please use the Q&A button, Q button on your screen. And if you have a comment that you'd like to make or a link that you'd like to share with the whole group, you can do that via the chat. If you put questions into the chat, I will lose track of them and I will not ask them. So use the Q&A button for questions that you actually want us to ask and use the chat to share anything you like, you know, pictures of your grandchildren, whatever. Um, but we're gonna get, I wanna also just let everybody know, everybody who signed up for this uh, Zoomversation, Zoominar, will get a uh, discounted subscription offer from the forward in your email. We will also send you uh, the video of this uh, conversation if you wanna go back to it or share it with your friends. So thanks again for being here. Thank you also to our team who put this on at the forward, Lisa Lepson, Gabby Brooks, Dina Kuberman, and uh, Mira Fox. And we are gonna get going. I'm gonna ask David to start us off by giving us kind of up to the minute how the situation looks from his perch in Washington, outside Washington, of what the likelihood is that Prime Minister uh, Benjamin Netanyahu will actually move forward, as he originally said, on July 1st to annex part or all of the West Bank. What, what, what is, is that likely to happen? What are the politics? What are, what's your latest best, best guess? And, and, what, and a little bit about what that means, and then we'll move forward with the what that means as we go. Okay, thank you. It's delighted to be on with you, Jody, and Khalil, an old friend for many decades. So thank you, uh, Jody, and the forward for organizing this. Um, look, right now, the annexation issue is, is a bit of a mess. Uh, it, there is really no clear direction. Uh, on one hand, it is an outgrowth of the Trump peace plan uh, that was put forward uh, in the White House on January 28th. And Netanyahu said, uh, after the election, I'd like to proceed with this. And um, you know, he would like to take all the settlements is, is, the, is the optimal for him that were allotted to Israel under the, the peace plan and front load them. Uh, 
uh, and saying, well, I don't, the Palestinians say they reject the plan. I accept the plan. So I want to front load all the settlements. It's 130 settlements. It's uh, over uh, about 465,000 people uh, that live in these 130 settlements and uh, make them, annex them to be part of Israel or the technical word he uses is apply Israeli sovereignty, which I think is basically the same thing. Um, but in going forward, what he's found is A, his junior partner, the Blue and White Party, led by two former chiefs of staff, Benny Gantz and Gabi Ashkenazi, are not on the same page with him. And the people that he thought would really push this forward, the Trump administration, seems to be having some second thoughts. And there's division within the, there um, that you have um, David Friedman, who's the ambassador to Israel, who seems more ideological, wants a full annexation of all 130 places. And you have uh, Pompeo, the Secretary of State, who's thinking, hey, there's some downside here regionally. What does this mean for the, the future of Israeli-Palestinian relations? Is, is there going to be instability in Jordan? Uh, is this a massive distraction from Iran? What about, uh, you know, Israeli Gulf relations? And then you've got Jared Kushner, who seems to be looking at this through the prism of the president's reelection, his father-in-law. And their view is, well, okay, we have our own differences. Now you should only go forward if there's an Israeli domestic political consensus. This is not a deal with Bibi, with the prime minister, it's a deal with Israel. Do they think that it will make it harder to reverse if they lose in November? Do they think that this gives them domestic political cover in the United States by saying, hey, two former chiefs of staff have signed off? But what the net effect of the Trump administration the last few days just now of saying the word consensus is that it has empowered these two guys, Gantz and Ashkenazi, to be a counterweight in a way that really statistically they weren't really needed because Bibi could probably get votes without them. So this has slowed things down. And, uh, you know, to, to quote someone else, if this was a Coca-Cola, it's not about, maybe this isn't about Coca-Cola Max, it's about either Coca-Cola Diet, Coca-Cola Light, or Coca-Cola Zero. Um, the, the range here may have dropped. Now, for the Palestinians, the Arab world, Democrats in the United States, many would say, we don't care if it's, annexation light or annexation max, we're against any of this because it's unilateral. So you could say this is a discussion that Israel's having with itself, but that discussion is slowing it down. And it's clear that uh, if Gantz and Ashkenazi go forward, they want something much more limited. They would like to know where the Jordanians are, and the king has said this would lead to a massive conflict. I think it was his words, he said then to Spiegel, his prime minister said it would freeze the treaty. It wouldn't cancel the treaty, but it would freeze it. The security ties would continue. Uh, and then you've got, you know, you have Oteba, the Emirati ambassador, and the Emirates are kind of Israel's new hot uh, partner in the Arab world, saying you can't have normalization and annexation. The overt part of Israeli Gulf ties would, would, would come to a halt. So, they, these are a lot of things, and Gantz and Ashkenazi would like to have something that as many people that could be lined up as possible sign on to. So they're clearly in the, in the annexation light to zero category. Bibi's in the annexation max category, uh, going to the full amount of the Trump plan. And that discussion is still ongoing, and my doubt is that this will be sorted out by July 1st, but maybe it will go through the summer and maybe into the fall as well. Thank you, David. That was a great overview. And I'm glad you brought in Coke Zero, the national drink of, I think, in, and in, of Israel, which I am not a fan of. I went during my four years there. I desperately missed uh, Diet Coke. <laughs> I, I am wearing, for the occasion of this Zoominar, um, a dress I bought in Akko, uh, the, Israeli, the Israeli Arab mixed city in, inside Israel. Um, I want to turn to you, um, Khalil, to talk a little bit about you know, how it feels from where you sit inside the Palestinian uh, world. Uh, in, you know, David's talking about all these political machinations. I wonder if, if, first of all, pick up on anything there to say where you where where you see anything differently, but also 
where what is the politics inside the Palestinian Authority and the West Bank and the other factions in terms of potential responses to Coke Light, Coke Zero, original Coke, whatever. Uh, thank you, Judy. It's a pleasure to be with you and with David. Um, it will not make almost any difference uh, what kind of annexation. If annexation is to take place, this will be seen by the Palestinians as a dramatic change uh, in the status quo. And what the, what, what the PA is currently doing will go into effect. Uh, similarly, with the, with the Palestinian public, I doubt very much that it will make much of a difference. If the PA does go ahead with um, its, its current policy, uh, this will also have dramatic consequences for the Palestinian public. Uh, um, both, therefore, the, although other factions are relevant, we're now talking about the PA as the main actor here. It is the one that will be calling the shots. Uh, in terms of uh, affecting the situation. Public opinion is going to be looking for answers to a lot of questions. There are a lot of questions on this with Israel ending its commitments to the Oslo Agreement. It did not at all explain to the Palestinian public what it means and what would be required of the Palestinian public. And so the public is, in fact, today not well, when Abbas first declared it, uh, there was a lot of indifference among the public because they didn't think it would mean anything. But now the public is uh, in, the, in a very, very different uh, mood. There is a great deal of, uh, of concern about what could happen. In fact, you can say that the public is essentially preparing for some kind of a war, political or otherwise, that will break no, out gonna, uh, very soon. And you're they have plenty of questions Khalil. that they have no answers to. Maybe we can talk. Khalil, I'm going to ask you to turn off your video in hopes that we can get a clearer audio. You're not able. It's a little shaky. So if you maybe turn off the video, uh, maybe we'll do a little better. Uh, sorry to everybody. If you're I will. Um, and I'm going to also ask you to say a little more specifically what you mean when you say if the, if the Palestinian Authority goes through with uh, its promised policy, which is to uh, essentially dissolve itself, right, and to, to push Israel to, if they annex anything, to take over uh, a lot of the uh, civil services that right now the PA is providing. Um, so when you get your, uh, yourself that, yeah, there we go. So can you, can you go into a little more detail about what Abbas has said he would do in response to any annexation move? Well, essentially there are four operative issues here that Abbas is threatening. Um, and under each one of those, there are a variety of indicators in each uh, that uh, these are measures that he can take. Uh, one is security coordination with Israel. He has already informed the Israelis that this is over. And as we know today, there has been no uh, security coordination between the two sides for almost two weeks now. Um, and, and here there are a lot of serious issues uh, that could have dramatic consequences uh, in Israeli-Palestinian relations with regard to this particular issue alone. Uh, but there are, of course, economic and financial relations between the two. 63% of the Palestinian budget comes from uh, the clearance revenues that Israel transfers uh, every month. So far, there has been no transfer since Abbas' announcement. We can discuss why this has been the case, but there hasn't been any, which means the PA is unable to pay salaries to the, to the entire public sector. There has been no payment whatsoever. Uh, it also means the PA cannot transfer any money to Gaza. Gaza is in a, a terrible mess already without the money that Abbas transfers uh, every month to Gaza, which is more than $100 million every month. Uh, the situation in Gaza will dramatically uh, deteriorate with very serious consequences to uh, Hamas-Israel's relations as well. 
And the third area where there is significant threat is the civil coordination. The civil coordination means everything in terms of daily life for the Palestinian public. That is about travel, it's about issuing of IDs and passports, it's about the, the civil register when you have a baby, where it is registered, the movement of the Palestinian leadership, uh, access to Israel through permits that Israel issues, uh, and so on. And finally, there is the basic need. Uh, we buy water and electricity, and the PA pays for that. Uh, what happens when the PA doesn't uh, coordinate and doesn't directly buy? Who is going to buy water, electricity, and gasoline, and so on? So we have these four packages of issues um, that uh, basically represent Israeli-Palestinian relations. And Abbas is basically saying all of this will be directly affected, uh, and, and there will be no Israel direct official PA Israel contacts regarding any of this. Well, uh, this essentially means destroying uh, if all the rules of the game that existed for the past 26 years since the creation of the Palestinian Authority, and certainly threatening the stability and perhaps even the existence of the Palestinian Authority. So uh, all of this are, are question marks at the moment. Uh, there are things that the PA had done already implemented, uh, but there are things it hasn't yet done. And if, the, if, if uh, after the announcement, if an announcement is made anytime soon, the PA begins full implementation of what it is uh, threatening to do, we will find ourselves in the middle of a game of chicken between the two sides, with the Israelis hoping that Abbas is bluffing and they will try to call his bluff. And if he's not bluffing, there will be serious, a very serious confrontation between Palestinians and Israelis. And all of this is just about the PA. We're not talking about Hamas yet. We're not talking about other factions and groups and what they might or might not do. And we're not talking about what kind of changes. Maybe some of it might be fundamental changes that the Palestinian public will go through as it begins to search for answers to questions in the past that had answers to, but right now, a lot of issues have no answers, and, uh, and, and, and they don't have an answer because nobody has yet put forward very clear answers to them. I, um, I, I really appreciate that, Khalil. It's, it's so interesting because I think we think about this, this question of annexation or not as really a political question, um, and then, and what are the political fallouts with relations with other countries, as David was sort of talking about, but you're, you're explaining that it's, it's also very much a security issue, I'm imagining future. I wonder, David, I mean, one of the characteristics that you and I, I mean, and Khalil too, but, uh, you know, as sort of observers, one of the kind of realities, but also frustrations about these kinds of conversations is how stagnant the conflict has been for so long. But I think what Khalil is reminding us is, um, first of all, how big a change annexation actually would be, but also really how much has actually changed in the last couple of years with both uh, with Netanyahu himself moving to the right and being kind of emboldened by the Trump administration. And, and I feel like sometimes, you know, there is a circularity to the story of, of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that it always feels like, wait, I've heard that before and that didn't happen exactly. And it, in some ways it feels like we're winding up to another one of those moments that he won't really move forward on July 1st, as we've been talking about. But can you, I'd love you to talk a little bit about this relationship between the pol pol politics and security. I mean, he's been very reluctant to make security risks, and yet we are talking about what seems like a very significant change if he moves forward. Why would that be? What's changed? Right, fascinating question, because um, you're right. He's famously risk averse, Netanyahu. For all his tough talk, you know, except for two kilometers in 2014 during the Gaza war where he had to send in troops because he felt that there were tunnels going from Gaza uh, into Israel. Netanyahu has never applied ground troops. I think he's the only prime minister since 1967. So he likes to, you know, talk tough, but he, he's actually very cautious when it comes to applying force. And you're right in saying, you know, what's changed? In, in the Knesset podium in 2011, 
uh, he was saying basically, well, I care, you know, the blocks, this, the, the settlement blocks right next to Israel, he, he made it clear like that was his priority. But why is he suddenly trying to annex 130 places? Um, 78 percent, 78 of those 130 are outside of the security barrier, and I think partly, you know, it's it's his trial. Uh, I'm sorry to say, I really uh, that he's become more indebted to the political right in Israel because uh, they're the ones most loyal to him, that are pushing back on the court system, claiming Netanyahu was persecuted. The Likud might be in power for 32 of the last 42 years, but they still run this image. And you say, oh, that sounds familiar in our country, in the United States, of the elite and the judiciary and the media persecuting them. Uh, and I'm the little guy. So uh, he is more indebted to them. Partly you could say is, look, Trump is the first president in American history who's to the right of an Israeli prime minister. And it seems to be giving him you know, uh, you know, an open check policy. And that's an amazing temptation for a Likud prime minister that he feels he can't pass up. So every time you could bring 30 different reasons, what is exactly the strategic benefit for Israel? And how come there isn't one? And he'll say, historic, historic. Because this Trump moment, they fear Trump is gonna lose. I mean, that's the real story here, that the right in Israel feels that the right in America is gonna lose because, uh, if they thought he was going to win, they'd have four more years, right, to play this out. But they don't feel that way. They, they read the polls here with the social protest movement and the coronavirus and the economic dislocation. So, you know, that's a piece of this is the temptation of Trump. Another piece is the indebtedness to the right. And what you said and what Khalil, you know, alluded to is so vital is the issue of the security dimension of this. You know, I've been saying this for years that the security establishment in Israel have become almost, you know, the lobbyists for the Palestinians in the Israeli cabinet. Not because they are ideological, but because they see the bigger situation. They see the bigger picture. They see the Palestinian Authority as a partner and not as a threat. And in their view, this has to be preserved. There should be no risk of a third intifada, for example, a third Palestinian uprising. And things would unravel if, if the Khalil scenario really does play itself out. And so the strongest voices are, are against, um, in the security uh, world, uh, 300 former generals, key figures, uh, Gadi Eisenkot, former chief of staff of the Israeli military, uh, Amos Yadlin, former head of military intelligence, Amos Gilad, the dean of the defense service. They all say there's no security benefits here. And if I was the editor of the Forward newspaper, I would say what I want to do now is I want to do a profile. I want to send out a, a, a reporter to follow this guy, Nadav Argaman, who is the head of the Shin Bet. And ultimately, in the Israeli system, those are the people who are going to get blamed if Israel is ill prepared on the Palestinian issue. And we know Argaman is against annexation. So we're waiting to hear his voice come out. And I think Gantz and Ashkenazi are actually positioning themselves to wait for some of these security voices to come out. I'm not waiting that, I'm not holding my breath for Aviv Kochavi, who's a brilliant chief of staff of the IDF. He's very super politically cautious uh, in, in not offending uh, the government in terms of military civil relations. I understand that. But Argaman's voice is something that we're gonna have to wait to hear about because I think he could he could even be a game changer in terms of saying where the current defense establishment is, not just the veterans, but they're all asking the same question. Give me the security win here. Give me the strategic gain for the state of Israel. And uh, you don't hear from the security establishment, that, that's significant. David is a uh, former reporter, and I always appreciate his uh, uh, advice on, on story framing, although I think you may forget uh, how difficult it is to get people from the Shin Bet to go on the record. Never mind, let somebody follow them around, but it's a good idea, and we'll look into it. Um, uh, so thanks for that. Um, Khalil, can you, can you share some of the findings um, from your recent polling? I know you're actually in the field now with a new poll, but um, confidence levels in the PA, confidence in a two-state solution, which has been tanking kind of over the last few years in the Palestinian public. I know you mentioned you've done a poll looking also at just the kind of 
Palestinian elite. So can you share what you think are the most salient and rele relevant findings from the public uh, from your research to this issue right now? Sure. <clears throat> I think the first issue that you've mentioned is the, is the single most important, and that is <clears throat> the extent to which the public has confidence in the Palestinian leadership. Unfortunately, there isn't really much of that. The public is very, very angry with the leadership because the leadership uh, in the eyes of the Palestinian public is seen as corrupt and authoritarian and lacks any credibility. This gulf, this uh, gap uh, in expectations between the leadership and the public essentially means that the leadership cannot move the public. If the public doesn't want to move, uh, the Palestinian leadership isn't going to be able to move it. In fact, if the Palestinian leadership asks the public to move, the public, because of this distrust, is not going to move. So um, if the Palestinian leadership hopes that there will be massive mass demonstrations, uh, nonviolent demonstrations, and so on, to express opposition to annexation as one of its main elements of responding, it will be disappointed. It is not likely to happen. I, we don't know exactly what will be the conditions. There are a lot of other factors that we'll have to, to we, for us to look at uh, in terms of w uh, whether the public is ready uh, to move in, in a massive manner uh, to the street. But this is a major concern. The lack of trust, the lack of credibility for the Palestinian leadership is going to be a major hindrance uh, for the leadership uh, to, to calibrate any response, any public response to the annexation. Uh, the, the, we have already seen during, uh, since the dec le declaration of the Trump plan, uh, that there has been already significant changes. Uh, we see the public moving away from the two-state solution. This has been the paradigm that has dominated Palestinian thinking in terms of uh, how to end the occupation. Now, what, what we saw from the last survey, and we're looking at the current one we are conducting now to see whether it will also confirm that, is that those who have abandoned the two-state solution have embraced uh, one democratic state, one person, one vote uh, as the way forward. This is how they responded to the Trump plan, believing that the Trump plan uh, essentially opens the door to a one-state outcome. It, can, it, it consolidates the one-state reality and essentially leaves everybody in, in, in without any doubt uh, in believing that uh, the, there is no return to a two-state outcome and that only a one-state uh, solution is, is the one acceptable. The, the third issue that we have found is the answer to the question, if diplomacy isn't working, or is not going to work, Israel is going unilateral, is doing what it wants to do, um, what is to replace diplomacy? What is to, to replace negotiations? And again, in the last survey, we saw significant rise in support for violence, uh, not in support of nonviolence. There is support for nonviolence, but it is violence and support for violence that has seen significant change only in two months between two surveys that we've conducted, uh, with the only change being the Trump plan. So these are three areas where we see significant um, changes in public attitude, the distrust in the PA, the, the one state, and the support for violence, uh, and, and the, overall, the overall pessimism that we see prevailing with people basically saying the Trump plan brings this conflict back to its existential roots. Uh, and that has a very, very harmful impact on the ability of people to, to show willingness to compromise. So uh, thank you, that's so helpful. I'm gonna um, try to go, it seems like we should take a look at the map now of the Trump plan. So I'm gonna try to share my screen and do that. Um, oh, except my, um, did my screen sharing is disabled. Can you help me out with that, Mira? Um, it says that the host has disabled attendee screen sharing. I want, what I wanna do is look at the map so people can make sure that, um, they understand what we're talking about. I know, David, you mentioned before that they were talking about 130 settlements, almost half a million Israeli Jews who are living in the West Bank. Uh, so for the last number of years, there's been quite a lot of concern about what would happen to those people if there was a two-state solution, according to the maps that the Clinton administration and others had put forward for a two-state solution plan. How would 
uh, Israel perhaps reabsorb some of those people, how, how, how complicated that would be. Now uh, that when we look at possibly annexing those areas, um, we then see how difficult it would it be to imagine a, a, a Palestinian state. Okay, I think we're good now. If I can just pull up, um, there we go. So here is, can you guys, are people seeing the map now? I don't, yeah, there we go. Okay, okay. good. Let me. Uh, and I can try to go deep closer in on it, but why don't you talk us through a little uh, bit about, right. because you, we've been talking so far about what the like immediate reaction would be, but I think we also right. really want to look at what would, what is possible if these areas are right. annexed? What happens to the two-state solution? What happens to the idea of a Palestinian state? And what happens to Israeli uh, security? Okay, thank you, Jody. And you know, I would hope that you know some of our viewers they want to do more deep dives on this. I have a whole website dedicated to maps called Settlements and Solutions. Every single settlement, its growth every year, even how they voted in the last five elections. I think I have over 600 pie charts. But what you're seeing here is the map of the West Bank, where the yellow area are Palestinian uh, areas. Um, and you're seeing in blue the um, Israeli settlements, and you're seeing in purple under the Trump plan what would be annexed to Israel. And you know, some of us who've been against the Trump peace plan, it's because of what Khalil mentioned in his surveys, we're, we're concerned that this doesn't make a two-state solution possible, but this makes a one-state outcome more likely which is antithetical to Zionism, which was to be a Jewish and democratic state. And our concern is that under the Trump plan, just of the terms of the plan, that Israel would control basically um, in these areas, which would be, let's say, 70% of the West Bank. I'm not even bringing in swap areas. That's ex territorial exchanges on the borders coming from inside Israel, out, you know, from the Israeli sovereign territory. But Israel will decide who goes in, who goes out. Israel will decide the security uh, for the Palestinians. And Palestinians will say, well, it's not then really a state. Uh, what happens, but, David, for, slow down just a sec. What happens to the 78 Palestinian communities with a total population of 109? Right, right, right. Maybe a few babies. Has not, what happens to those people who'd be annexed into Israel? Right. No one has really asked that question, I think, uh, fully in, in the media yet. So I think you're one of the first. Uh, we've done the numbers. We've gone through about 900 different villages and sub-villages, uh, working with uh, also the Palestinian Central Bureau of Statistics, the UN, UNHOC, and that was our figure, um, 109,594. And our point there is that, you know, are they going to have rights or not? The prime minister was asked about the, the Palestinians in the Jericho area that would be is under Israel. He said, no, they would vote in Palestinian elections and would not have rights. But no one has asked the question about the full 109,000. And I think that's a really an important question. So my fear is to, to zoom out a little bit on the Zoom conversation, to zoom out, it's the, the question is if you annex, uh, you know, all these settlers uh, in uh, 109,000 of them, by the way, it turns out same figure, are outside the security barrier. That's the red area on the fence. Is this, if is you this annex, slide better for them? Right, there's 78 settlements there. And if you annex those 78, it's on, you know, that's another 100 and, um, you know, there's the, ins, you know, but I'm talking about the full Trump plan right now, not the inside the barrier, but the no, outside the barrier that. too. Our fear is that you will, and that's why Dennis Ross and I wrote our book, uh, Be Strong and of Good Courage, is that you will so entangle these communities on one hand, and you'll have the Palestinians possibly giving up. Khalil is the expert on Palestinian polling data, so I defer to him. I've seen the numbers of young Palestinians that are concerning me, that my, our fear is the Palestinians say, forget it, let's just do one state. And I think that will change the paradigm um, in this country too, that people will say, well, if it's not a territorial paradigm, maybe it's a rights-based paradigm, let everyone vote in Israeli elections. That's something Israel can't agree to if it wants to remain a Jewish democratic state. Um, and so I'm, I'm concerned that the Trump plan is going to accelerate this one state move instead of do what it says it wants to do, which is to provide for two states. And that's 
why I think a full annexation makes a disentangling, a separation, whatever you want to call it, but it makes the eventuality of two states less likely and increases the clamor for one state. So thank you for uh, that. I love looking at your maps and we put the link uh, to uh, your, your, your map site into the chat. Uh, we will send all of the links along with the video in a follow-up email to, to anybody who's here and anyone who signed up and couldn't make it. I wanna, I'm going to actually turn to the questions from the group uh, earlier than I might have because they're really good. And one of them you just kind of glanced at, David. So I'm going to go back to you, Bob Olshan, and I think someone else in the chat both ask, uh, basically, what can American Jews who are concerned about Israel staying a Jewish and democratic state or who are concerned about the two-state solution surviving, what can they do? Uh, Bob asks, is it too late for us to have an influence? Um, and yeah, what, what's a liberal Zionist to do? It's a great question. I mean, you know, the, the prime minister, you know, on one hand, there's an acknowledgement that the people who actually died for the country, the soldiers, are, are citizens. And so they have a certain standing on the, you know, so I, I want to be clear about that. On the other hand, this prime minister and every prime minister of Israel makes clear that this is a state of, of all the Jewish people. And I think that does give Jews, uh, you know, around the world a sense to make their views known uh, on this issue uh, of Israel. And I think, um, you know, I think it, it's worth contacting Israeli friends and asking about it. What, what's happening, if you look at the Israeli polls, and again, I know Khalil follows that as well, but what's striking there is that on one hand, you'll get 51% uh, of Israelis, 58% Israeli Jews who say they're for annexation. But if you say, is it your top priority, the number drops to the four or 5%. Uh, and this was just, we just saw that in channel 12, which is a, the, the top network in Israel last week. We've seen it uh, in terms of when people say, but if you had to choose between annexation and close ties with Jordan, for example, the numbers drop. So I think it's important to, to contact your Israeli friends, relatives, and just say, hey, tell us what you're thinking here. You know, there's a lot of strategic downsides for Israel. And I know that the rejoinder comes back, oh, we heard violence, you know, and people said that about the embassy, when they moved the embassy and it really didn't happen. So maybe you guys are a bunch of Cassandras and just being a bit alarmist and defeatist and all that. But the issue isn't what happens literally the day after. It's about these broader issues of identity uh, that, I, that I mentioned before about the fear of a one state outcome and the strategic implications. When you have the, uh, a guy high ranking in the Emirates who's saying, look, we're doing good stuff with Israel we don't want to, you know, we want this to continue. And I'm appealing to you in an Israeli newspaper. I think that shows you that even the Arab states realize the importance of the Israeli domestic arena at this time. Um, Khalil, I want, uh, well, we did actually have, I think two people have asked the question of, that David just brought up of like, oh yeah, everyone thought moving the embassy would be, you know, the third rail and it, sparked a little protest and now people kind of, it's not even a real issue anymore. So I want you to talk about why you think this would be different. And then you can go from there. Norman Elshansky wants to know, are there any leaders within the PA who could emerge, um, have support of the people and the ability to negotiate with Israel and other nations? I suppose that's a question about post annexation, but really it's, it's the perennial question, right? We've been asking this question for years with Abbas's advancing age and, and extending his his time in office longer than his term, you know, what is there a, a replacement for him who we can imagine doing more, doing better uh, in terms of, of moving the Palestinian national aspirations forward? So first, why would this be different than the embassy? How, you know, is it really such a big deal? And then second, are there leaders within the PA who could emerge? Well, uh, they are both are very good questions. And I, I don't know how different it will be from the uh, Jerusalem embassy in terms of how the public will respond. I, I think uh, the major unknown <clears throat> is whether the public would be able to overcome the distrust it has in its leadership and to forget about the leadership and, and, and come out and express uh, its views, what, what we hear from the Palestinian public. This overwhelming rejection 
uh, of the um, Trump plan and of the Israeli decision and so on. What is new, however, this time is that the PA has decided it will be the dynamic player here by essentially severing all these links it has with Israel. Um, the, 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 the destabilization of the Palestinian Authority begins and it, uh, it snowballs ultimately in the destruction of the Palestinian Authority. Now, even if it doesn't lead to the destruction anytime soon, as the PA becomes weaker, month after month, its ability, uh, and in the absence of security coordination, its ability to control the street, its ability to prevent clashes with the Israeli army, which continues uh, to uh, enter into Palestinian cities and towns, even without an, uh, the coordination. One of the most sensitive issues is this Israeli incursion in Palestinian areas. Yesterday, they were in Ramallah, in various neighborhoods in Ramallah, testing uh, what happens if they are to enter Ramallah. Will the Palestinian police shoot at them? Will there be any armed clashes between the Palestinian security services and the Israeli security services. In the past, due, when security coordination was in place, one way to avoid that was for the Israeli police and army to inform the Palestinians that they are coming. In this case, the Palestinian army armed forces uh, basically go back to their barracks, and the Israeli army has free two or three or four hours to do what it wants to do, and then it leaves. Now there is no such thing as coordination, and the, so far, the PA has basically instructed its armed forces um, to withdraw when, when they see the Israeli army. Well, will this remain, for example, if Israel does go ahead with annexation? Will the Palestinian uh, police, uh, if, if, if there are confrontations and Palestinians die every day at the hands of the Israeli soldiers, would the, an, an Israeli incursion be left without any resistance by the Palestinian security services? We have absolutely no idea. If, however, it, uh, one incident is to happen, there is no way for the two sides now to sit down and make sure it does not happen again. There is no coordination, period. And, and this is simply one small example of how things could deteriorate significantly, even without the PA being dismantled, without the PA collapsing. But if the PA does collapse, then there is no Palestinian body representing the Palestinians. The Israeli army will be forced to occupy the entire area, uh, either by uh, just military rule or by bringing back the civil administration. The two-state solution is, is over, and this becomes a one-state reality that everybody will see as one of a system of apartheid and where Israel will have to make a decision, either to withdraw completely from the West Bank, which is not uh, at all uh, likely, or to uh, basically incorporate uh, 3 million Palestinians in the West Bank into Israel. So we're looking at immediate issues where there is a lot of uncertainty, but also all this destabilization of the PA and what it could mean. And of course, uh, if the PA is not paying salaries, it's not paying the security services, it does not paying it's the entire public sector. We have 180,000 people who are paid. We have people, other, you're talking about almost 1 million people who um, uh, gain from the existence of the PA. Without uh, the PA, they are left with no one to uh, help them. And in, in this case, obviously, uh, they might become subject to radicalization and, and so on. And, and, and if the PA is gone, who else is to replace it? And well, Hamas is one possible alternative. Yeah. Now, if, if Abbas is gone in the middle of all of this, well, this will bring further destabilization into the picture. The Palestinians will find it extremely difficult to uh, sit down and select a successor. And even if they do, that successor is not going to have legitimacy. And so without legitimacy, there will be a lot of uh, disagreement, discontent, and people will challenge that leader. That could mean internal Palestinian infighting as well. 
Thank you, Khalil. Um, just want to, mindful of the time, we do have quite a lot of excellent questions and comments. I want to remind everybody to put questions you want me to ask the panelists into Q&A and not into the chat. Um, there was a comment uh, that came just to us that, uh, that, that whether we seem to be more concerned or only concerned about the impact of this on Israel. And I, I just want to say, absolutely not. We invited Khalil specifically because we want to understand um, how this plays out for Palestinian people. And uh, I think he's done an excellent job of detailing incredibly well just in that answer and before. So we spent quite a bit of time and it's incredibly important to focus on what would be the impact um, on the lives of everyday Palestinians, as well as on the Palestinian national movement and the leadership. Um, uh, I, I have a question here from, um, which unfortunately was in the chat, which makes it harder for me to see, but um, I did, uh, a couple things. For, one, Rabbi Claire Ginsburg Goldstein is asking really specifically, how does annexation fast forward the West Bank uh, or fast forward the conflict really into forcing a one state solution in place of a two state solution. What entanglement do you foresee? Um, and are there too many Israeli settlements that are intertwined in the same neighborhoods? Is, is that what you're saying? And I guess the real question is, we know there are, when we look at that map, that yes, there are many settlements deep into the West Bank and the, the lives are already intertwined and it's very complicated. And that's why so many people talk about a one state reality. So how does annexation specifically uh, potentially fast forward a one state reality and, and is it, and I guess the real question and somebody else also commented like that I'm delusional because I keep mentioning a two state solution which is already uh, dead. So part of the underlying question always in all these discussions is, yeah, is the two state solution already uh, an impossibility? So David, why don't you take up that and then, but try to keep your answer short. We have only 13 minutes till Khalil leaves us for sure until the schedule's over and we've got a bunch of great questions. Sorry, David, your audio is not on, you're on mute. Okay, so look, to these questions, yes, I was referring to the almost 110,000 settlers living outside of the security barrier. And even under the Trump plan, some of these people would be enclaves inside of a Palestinian state that I think it would not be workable. And so I think if we want two distinct entities, you do not want to annex people in, in, in these 78 places in particular outside uh, the security barrier. Uh, and uh, you will make this like a, you know, a Balkans-like situation that you will not be able to disentangle them anymore. It'll be like a scrambled egg that you can't unscramble. So, and, uh, I mean, there's that and there's everything Khalil has been describing about a potential reaction, which would, of course, set up what right. I think. Of course. Then there's the element of the unraveling of the Palestinian Authority, as Khalil just said. And who, who takes that vacuum? Who fills a vacuum in the Middle East? Hamas, um, you know, that, or is Israel have to assume the economic burden of directly occupying all, all these people? So Israel doesn't want that. The security establishment doesn't want that. So, you know, whether it's the, 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 the security environment, whether it, it, it relates to Israel's identity, I think these two are not mutually exclusive. They're reinforcing that, um, that I just think it's, it's a bad idea. I don't know what you get at it. You know, if someone would say to me, David, but what if they annex like Gush Etzion, Malay Adumim, areas that even the Palestinians, Gush Etzion was on the Palestinian maps. That was part of a negotiated deal, not a unilateral deal. But if they had offsets and, and they could talk to the Palestinians. By the way, the Palestinians do have a card here to stop this whole process, but we haven't talked about that yet. And I don't know what Khalil thinks about that. What but is if it? the Palestinians would say, we're willing to sit with Jared Kushner tomorrow. We don't agree with the Trump plan at all, but we're going to make a counteroffer. They have, the White House has made clear that a Palestinian counteroffer would stop annexation in its track. But the Palestinian position, as I understand it, and again, Khalil could differ with me, is for us to sit with the US, we boycotted the US since 2017, uh, is to legitimize it. We did put something forward to the quartet, that's the US, Russia, European Union, the Secretary General of the UN, it's unclear what this something is. That would be the one thing that would halt it, because the administration is looking for some validation. I think it would have zero impact on the American elections, people would, uh, but it, it could stop the annexation issue. But for the Palestinians, this seems to be an issue of pride right now, so. Khalil, what do you uh, think about that card? Is that possible? Uh, 
I think it's more than pride, David. I think it's about survival as well. The Palestinian Authority is very, very reluctant to <clears throat> expose its real positions. And uh, this is why it keeps hiding behind generalizations, what it will do, what kind of peace agreement it was willing to reach with Israel. Uh, broad terms uh, is what the PA is currently willing uh, to, to publicly declare. The minute the PA gets into the details, then it gets into very, very controversial um, positions that, that many people in the public would not accept. Hamas will capitalize on that. Abbas is very reluctant uh, and would rather keep his lips sealed rather than <clears throat> get into the details and, and present a counter proposal. Uh, I, I actually tend to agree with David that that's exactly what he should have actually wrote a piece to the Palestinian leadership um, almost a year before the Trump plan was revealed in which I said the plan will soon be revealed. You must have a counter offer prepared. Do that jointly with our countries. Have as much details as possible, as detailed as the American plan. And this will be your counter offer immediately proposed the minute the US president finishes delivering his plan, Abbas must deliver his plan as a counter offer. And the Palestinian leadership said, no, thank you. And again, we are uh, the center Iran has issued a policy paper in which it asked for that again, that this should be done now. There should be a detailed Palestinian counter proposal. It does not have to accept the American plan. It can simply say, this is our counter proposal, but it has to be as detailed. It has to have a detailed map as well. And it has to reach out to the Israeli public, not just to the Trump administration with this plan. And, and the PA, as I said, is very, very reluctant uh, to expose its position this way because it doesn't want to lose more public support. Khalil, uh, quickly, is the two-state solution dead? If annexation goes ahead, the answer is absolutely yes. It is dead. But if annexation does not, I am still one of those very few people who believe in the two-state solution and believe in its feasibility. Uh, if the Trump administration, if, the Trump, if Trump is elected for another four years, then even without annexation, the two-state solution is gone. So a couple of, uh, both you and David mentioned the lack of confidence in the U.S. as a broker um, and cutting off ties entirely in 2017. Honestly, when I was there between 2012 and 2016 during the Kerry talks and after they broke down, um, but long before Trump was elected, it already was clear that the U.S. was, uh, the U.S.'s status as a, as a broker had been, had been uh, lowered in the Palestinian um, eyes. Uh, so a couple of people are asking, is there, is there another intermediary? And one person asked specifically, wouldn't Jordan be a better, a better um, broker or, or in, 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 you know, interlocutor or whatever? Is, is that possible? What do you guys think about that? Uh, I would look, I think if you look at where the talks have been most successful, uh, they, they begin with Israel and the Arabs themselves. Israel and Egypt dealt with each other directly. Israel and Jordan dealt with each other directly. The U.S. has came in to, to kind of maybe in certain places, you know, for bridging proposals, but you bridge over a river, you don't bridge over an ocean. So I do think direct talks is ideal. I do, you know, I don't subscribe to the idea that the two-state solution is dead at this point. We'll have to see what happens in the American presidential elections in November. Um, so, I mean, I, I think we'll have to wait that out, but I, I think there's no substitute for Israel and the, and the Palestinians for sitting directly with each other uh, to solve their problems. I do have my skepticism if you could solve all the problems uh, under the current leadership of Abbas and, and Netanyahu, the Venn diagram might not overlap. To use my baseball metaphor, even if you can't hit a home run because uh, you swing for the fences, you should try to hit some solid singles. We need the public's back in the game. Khalil does the poll. You know, there was a time that both of these societies had over 50% support for two states. And they might say, well, the other side doesn't want it. But the fact is, is that nobody is at 50% now. It's under. And that is, to me, is very scary. And therefore, we need some singles that would prove to people that there's something real going on uh, because 
there's a profound sense of public disbelief at this time. We have a couple of good political questions. I think these are actually both probably, well, I mentioned both of your perspectives. One is a US political question, which is, might the Trump administration be trying to slow annexation now in, in order to um, push Israel to do it closer to the election um, and appeal to evangelicals? Um, and I guess part of that question is also like, where are the votes for annexation? I mean, there, there are all these Democrats um, who have signed these letters, who are Zionist Democrats who have signed these letters opposing it, who represent a lot of Jewish areas. Anyway, what, so thoughts about Trump's political calculus. And then Gary Gilbert is asking if Netanyahu does not move on July 1 or shortly after, as he has said he would, would this, could this jeopardize the existing coalition? Could it potentially lead to the collapse of the government and our favorite thing in Israel elections? Look, I would just say from, from where I see it is that I don't know if I haven't seen any polling <coughs> suggesting evangelicals are going to vote for Trump on annexation. Um, they don't necessarily know the maps. Uh, I think they feel, look, on a lot of things they care about from Israel, he's, he's delivered for them as they see it. And they might have other priorities that have nothing to do with Israel, like the Supreme Court, although they might be surprised in certain areas. Uh, but so I don't know how much annexation is really going to help this president at all politically. I tend to think his go slow approach is, is more for to get political cover here because this issue has been criticized so much. And he would like something that two former chiefs of staff of the Israeli military have signed off on. So that's how I see it. It's ironic that it's Trump, that it's Bibi who doesn't want it too close to the elections because he says, what if Biden is ahead in the polls and I do it then, then it'll look like a finger in his eye and I don't want to poke him that way. Uh, he also I think hopes that that the Gulf, that, that Trump will contact the Gulf states for him and there's a better chance of doing that earlier rather than in the heat of a general election when this is maybe number 100,000 on the priority list. We don't think that it, that it threatens Netanyahu's coalition to do nothing, does no, it? In fact, no, his coalition well, well be how it plays is going to be interesting. It's a great question. And I tend to think what will happen is it's easier for him to, to blame Gantz and Ashkenazi. He likes to do that. And if he can't get what he wants. You see, he's raised expectations through the roof with the settlers to the point that the settlers, some of the settlers, the settlers closest to the 67 line just say, say yes to Trump and say thank you. Those further in, so they'll be closer to Palestinian state, say, hey, what about the Palestinian state? We think Trump is a liberal. We don't like this plan at all. Just take the annexation and run. Um, so there's, there, so he's raised expectations very high on the settler thing. How he's going to square these circles, it's unclear. I tend to think he's going to, to blame these guys if, if it can happen. And if Trump sends out a tweet, I'll deal with this after the November elections in the way that BB tweeted for, in the last three elections. Yeah. I'll deal with it afterwards. Well, Leo, I know you need to leave us because um, uh, you have another event. If you have a final word or so, and then I'll, I, I will keep people, whoever wants to stay, I have maybe one more question for David. I, I would say I, I want to answer the question about alternative uh, mediating uh, actors. I, I, it seems from what we see in, in, in public opinion that the closest we can get to an actor who can play this role with the acceptance of Israelis and Palestinians are the Russians. Um, it, it is not Jordan or any other Arab player, but uh, the Russians and certainly not Europe and not the UN. Uh, for the Palestinians, the Americans are out, but it is what Israelis prefer. The Palestinians prefer an international uh, forum, whether it's the UN or even the EU. But Russia seems to be acceptable. And we know that the Palestinians have been open to the idea of uh, a meeting in Russia with Netanyahu. Not yet clear what would be the purpose of this meeting, but um, this seems to be something that is acceptable. To the Palestinian side. Uh, that's thank you for bringing that up. That is so, such a so, such an important thing to think about in terms of the uh, American context too, in terms of what how everybody here feels about Russia uh, right now. So thank you, Khalil, for joining us. As I said, if you can stay with us for a couple more minutes, David, I've got one more question for sure. you. Um, we so appreciate you. talking to you. Thank and you, I'm sorry, uh, Take Bye. care. I hope to see you uh, soon at home. Um,
David, uh, there's a really, and I know some people also will probably have to leave because they have appointments. So I just want to thank everybody for being with us. Thank again, Lisa Lepson, Dina Cooperman, um, Gabby Brooks, and Mira Fox, as well as the folks at the Washington Institute and the Palestinian uh, Center for Policy and Survey Research for making this happen. I want to let everyone know that we have another Zoom. I'm hosting another conversation on Friday on Juneteenth with Rabbi Sandra Lawson and Tem Tema, Swift, Tema Smith, our columnist, a Jewish conversation about Juneteenth, very timely this year. Um, and we have something on Yiddish music on Monday with our um, Yiddish editor, Rachel Schechter. You can find all that on our events page. Please make sure you're signed up for our email newsletters um, and watch in your email box for all these links and the video. The question I wanna end with David is from Jesse Kleinman, who um, I think speaks probably for a lot of people on this call, actually. He says, as a Jew and progressive Zionist who supports a two-state solution, I oppose the BDS movement, boycott, divestment, and sanctions. But if annexation happens, Jesse says, it will be harder to oppose this. What should I do in case of annexation? And I believe you too, David, are a progressive Zionist who opposes the BDS movement. So I ask you. Look, I've visited, uh, I've made over 148 campus visits. Uh, and a lot of it was to discuss BDS. I, I think it's, it's a mistake um, uh, a lot. I, I, you know, you could say, are we, are we gonna be in a new reality? Um, I think we should see what happens in November. I tend to think if, if Biden wins the presidency, uh, he's, he's gone on record as opposing it. Uh, will he reverse American recognition? It's something we, we, we haven't seen before, but could that happen? Um, you know, these, you know, it, it won't change the underlying reality in the sense that uh, we'll see what the American position is. What good is this annexation if the U.S. doesn't recognize it? <coughs> So I'm not willing to uh, throw in the towel in any way, shape, or form. I think it's way too soon. We don't know if Netanyahu is going forward at all. I, you know, I just think what I said before, that we, all of the people who are connected to the forward, in my view, in some ways, if I'm making a gross generalization, but have no people in Israel and have friends and family there and care about it, are progressive Zionists. And I think there's a way of, of, of expressing, um, you know, your feelings to them. I, I don't under, I don't think that's irrelevant because I really think Israel's self image is the state of the Jewish people. So I, I tend to think that, you know, um, you know, we, we shouldn't give up. The great thing about Israel is wherever your views are on the political spectrum, you have a counterpart in Israel. And I'm finding it uh, also, now I, I do, I know that the, the, the forward people, you know, people who read the forward and are, are hip and, uh, you know, are podcast people, uh, Jody, so I, if I could throw in a commercial too, oh, yeah. uh, for decision points, uh, my conversation with people who've been really at the center of dramatic moments of the U.S. as a relationship, the book, Be Strong and of Good Courage, is about to remind people there were leaders in Israel who took historic uh, decisions. They did what they thought was best for the country. And that meant political opposition, often on the right, on, on key issues. But they did it because they thought it was the right thing to do. So I, I would hope, and I mentioned the settlement's a solution for people who are settlement geeks, who could do, do a deep dive there, a newsletter, I have DaveMurkowski.com. You know, I'm trying to reach out to people because I realize there are people who are not of the view of, uh, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu, right or wrong, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't, uh, you should disconnect from Israel. I hope nobody disconnects because you have counterparts there okay. who feel in the same way as you do. Thank you, David. I mean, the reason we invited you and Khalil is, is precisely, you know, the forwards mission on, on this topic and on all topics is really to bring light and information and to um, help people see perspectives other than their own and to get to get to facts too. And I, I so appreciate both uh, the detail with which you and, and sort of accountability with which you do your reporting and your maps and also the kind of context and big picture that you bring and decision points and the book are so interesting and inspiring because they really take that zoomed out look that doesn't get so stuck in how the politics of the last few years have been in this kind of really uh, frustrating stalemate. And um, you really, uh, you know, my, my favorite part um, when we talked about it is 
is to think about it all as a, a, in, in the context of Nachshon, the, the, uh, the, the biblical character from the Passover story. And uh, he, Nachshon was the first person to step into the Red Sea, not because he knew for sure it was gonna part and he would be okay, but because he knew for sure if he stood still, uh, that there was only certain death because the Egyptians were coming behind him. And, you know, uh, we need more Nachshons in the world. So thank you, David, for being with us. Thank you all. I hope everyone has, if you're on the East Coast, a good lunch. Um, if you're in Israel, a good dinner um, or, or Ramallah or the West Bank um, and continue to stay up with this issue, read the foreword and come back to our other events. So thanks again. Take care. Thank you, thank you Jody, for everything you do. Thank you. Thank you.